Uh, I've discussed two mechanisms of transcriptional precision in the early Drosophila embryo, shadow enhancers and pause polymerase. These two mechanisms ensure robust, rapid, and uniform patterns of gene activation, and when used together, very rapid rates of RNA synthesis. I want to finish up by discussing mechanisms of transcriptional repression. And I've already alluded to the importance of repression in the early Drosophila embryo. For example, repressors form the two borders of the Eve stripe 2 pattern. The snail repressor establishes the boundary between the mesoderm and the neurogenic ectoderm. And now I want to address how does this repression work. And I will turn specifically to the snail repressor. So here, once again, we're looking at the expression of the SOG gene in the early embryo. As I've mentioned a few times, SOG is activated by low levels of the dorsal gradient in the lateral neurogenic ectoderm. It's kept off in the ventral mesoderm by the snail repressor. And of course, SOG is one of those uh, magic genes that has both pause polymerase and a shadow enhancer. The enhancers aren't shown here, but earlier I showed you that SOG has both a primary intronic enhancer and a remote uh, five prime shadow enhancer. So SOG, like snail, comes on quite quickly and uniformly in the early embryo. Now, SOG, in fact, beats snail to the punch and is turned on a little bit before there are critical levels of the snail repressor. So initially, SOG is turned on in both the ventral regions that will form the mesoderm as well as the lateral regions that will form the neurogenic ectoderm where SOG becomes stably expressed. And a graduate student in the lab, Jacques Bothma, has done high resolution imaging of this loss of SOG expression, although it's only transiently expressed, this loss of transient expression of SOG in the ventral mesoderm due to the snail repressor. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show you. The experimental design is summarized here. So this summarizes the SOG transcription unit. It's a fairly large gene, 20 kilobases, with a large 5' prime intron and 3' prime intron. Jacques made separate fluorescent probes to the 5' prime intron and the 3' prime intron. The true two probes are separated by 10 kilobases. And then he mixed these together and hybridized them to staged embryos. When the SOG gene first comes on, you only see green hybridization signals. And that's because the polymerase is only located within the first intron, so the only nascent transcripts present at this early stage of activation of SOG uh, contain only five prime intronic sequences. But after a delay, the polymerase enters the three prime intron, and as it does so, the five, the five prime intron is spliced out. That's indicated by this little lariat. Then the polymerase extends into the three prime intron, and now the three prime intronic hybridization probe cross reacts with these nascent transcripts. So after a delay, the SOG gene is stably expressed. You see yellow hybridization signals because the nuclei contain a mixture of nascent transcripts containing either five prime intronic sequences or three prime intronic sequences. So now the question is, how does snail work as a repressor? The snail repressor kicks in and will switch the gene off in the ventral mesoderm, as I mentioned. And there are at least two possible mechanisms. One possibility is that snail disrupts polymerase elongation. The polymerase is stopped right in its tracks, so the polymerase falls off and the gene is immediately shut off. And so according to this view, we should go from a yellow hybridization signal when the gene is on to no hybridization signals at all, just a blue, unlabeled nucleus. So that's if snail works at the level of polymerase elongation. A second mechanism is that the polymerase works at the level of initiation by blocking the release of the pause polymerase from the promoter. Now according to this mechanism, once snail kicks in, there is no new synthesis, there's no new release of polymerase, but the elongating polymerases that were released prior to the onset of snail repression are able to complete transcription. And if so, we should see an intermediate stage of hybridization 
which we call the red flash. These are the elongating polymerases completing transcription of the gene that had been released from the promoter prior to the onset of snail repression. So according to the first mechanism, inhibition of elongation, we should go from yellow to off. According to the second mechanism of blocking the release of polymerase or transcription initiation, we should go from yellow to red to off. And this is what we see. So we've obtained evidence that snail works at the level of transcriptional initiation, blocking the release of polymerase, but the polymerase that had already been released completes transcription, even after the onset of snail repression. And some evidence for that is shown here. So here you're looking at progressively older nuclear cleavage cycle 14 embryos. These embryos were double labeled with the green 5' intronic probe and the red 3' intronic probe, looking at SOG expression and repression. When SOG is first switched on, you see only green hybridization signals. Activation is fairly synchronous, as we would expect for a gene containing pause polymerase, and it's very rapid as we would expect for a gene that has both pause polymerase and a shadow enhancer. And you see expression in both lateral regions where the gene will be stably expressed and ventral regions where it's going to get shut off. At this early stage, the only nascent transcripts contain hybridization with the 5' intronic probe. The polymerase has not yet entered the 3' intron. After a 10 minute delay, the nuclei stain yellow, and that's because now the polymerases have entered the 3' intron and we get hybridization with both the green 5' intronic probe and the red 3' intronic probe. And this delay of 10 minutes going from green to yellow is consistent with the rate of polymerase elongation of 1 kb a minute, as I mentioned before and was shown previously in John Liss's lab. Okay, so now SOG is stably on, the snail repressor kicks in, and you see that SOG is getting gradually repressed in the ventral mesoderm over time. And it takes a long time to switch off SOG expression, about 20 minutes between the onset of the snail repressor and the elimination of SOG expression in the ventral mesoderm. And you see an intermediate stage of the red flash right here. And that's the elongating polymerases completing the transcription of the 3' intron that had been released prior to the onset of snail repression. So this red flash is very good evidence that snail works at the level of initiation, not elongation. Elongating polymerases complete transcription even after the snail repressor has kicked in. But this mechanism of repression, blocking the release of polymerase from the promoter, blocking initiation, means that there's going to be a repression lag. And that lag is commensurate with the size of the gene. SOG is 20 kilobases in length, and it takes 20 minutes to fully repress SOG expression, to completely eliminate its expression in the ventral mesoderm. And that's due to the elongating polymerases completing transcription even after the onset of snail repression. We estimate that during this repression lag of 20 minutes, as many as 50 to 100 unwanted SOG mRNAs could be made in the mesoderm, where they're not needed. Moreover, those ectopic SOG mRNAs may cause developmental problems. And so if you want to get rid of transcripts that are produced after the onset of repression that arise due to this repression lag, you might have to rely on post-transcriptional mechanisms such as microRNAs. And SOG is indeed regulated by a specifically expressed microRNA, possibly getting rid of, cleaning out those transcripts made after the onset of snail repression due to this repression lag. Large genes, really large genes, have a more severe problem with the repression lag. There are Hox genes in the Drosophila genome, like in Tenopedia and UBX, which are on the order of 100 kilobases in length. It literally takes an hour and a half to repress these genes. Both in Tenopedia and UBX are subject to extensive regulation by microRNAs, possibly due to this repression lag issue. So now, once snail represses SOG in the ventral mesoderm, pause polymerase is once again established at the SOG promoter. 
although SOG is never going to get turned on in the mesoderm. So it's turned off in the mesoderm by three hours after fertilization, no more SOG transcription in the mesoderm, and it will never come back on in the mesoderm throughout the life cycle of the fly, never again. Over the next several hours of development, the pause polymerase at the promoter regions of SOG in the mesoderm is lost. And so you go from a gene that's repressed but poised, it's poised by virtue of containing the pause polymerase, to repressed and silent, which lacks the pause polymerase. Okay, so this is a more stable form of gene silencing. So I want to discuss this transition between repression achieved by snail, but you still have the pause polymerase, to the silencing of this gene in the mesoderm, because you've now removed the pause polymerase, and the gene will never again come back on in the mesoderm. This transition from repressed but poised or paused to silenced is mediated by a special group of repressors called the polycomb repressors. And an example is shown on the next slide. This shows a polycomb mutant called ESC or extra sex combs. And what you're looking at is the cuticle or the secretion of the ventral skin in late staged embryos. In polycomb mutants such as ESC, all the body segments acquire the phenotype of the posterior most eighth abdominal segment, or A8. So in polycomb mutants, the anterior abdomen, the thorax, and even some of the head segments are transformed into A8. That's what you see in the ESC mutant. This transformation is due in part to the misexpression of a Hox gene called abdominal B. Abdominal B is normally transcribed at the highest levels in the developing A8 segment. But in polycomb mutants, abdominal B is transcribed at high levels throughout the embryo, and that transforms all the body segments to an A8 identity. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning a anterior Hox gene called Antenopedia, and there are others like ultrabithorax and, and uh, uh, sex combs reduced. Antenopedia is transcribed normally in the middle thorax, in T2. But in the ESC mutants, ABDB is transcribed everywhere, ABDB is a repressor, and it switches antenopedia off, and that leads to this transformation of the thorax into extra A8 posterior segment identities. So a postdoc in the lab, Vivek Chopra, did whole genome pull to chip binding assays to look genome-wide at the distribution of RNA polymerase in advanced staged wild-type embryos and ESC mutants. And he found a significant increase in the amount of pause polymerase in ESC mutants at a couple of thousand different genes. So an example is shown here. This is the antenopedia gene itself. Antenopedia has several promoters. This is the proximal most promoter. In wild-type embryos, you see a little bit of polymerase binding at the promoter, a little bit of pause polymerase. But in the ESC mutants, you see a significant increase in the amount of pause polymerase at the promoter. And this was surprising to us because I said in ESC mutants, ABDB is transcribed everywhere and antenopedia is shut off. So you see more polymerase binding in the ESC mutant at the antenopedia promoter even though the gene is off in these mutants. And this trend of increased polymerase binding, increased pause polymerase in ESC mutants, as I said, is seen for a couple of thousand genes. A few more examples are shown on the next slide. So here are two patterning genes, pox meso, twin of igon. In advanced stage wild type embryos, these genes contain little or no pause polymerase. But in ESC mutants, you start seeing significant pause polymerase at the promoters. So this is the trend. In polycomb mutants, there is an increase in paused polymerase. And our model for what's going on, and we have some additional evidence for this, which I'm not going to show right now, is summarized in this last uh, model slide. So here's a gene that's repressed but poised because it contains paused polymerase. Again, think about the SOG gene in the mesoderm of a three-hour embryo after snail has finally shut it down 
after the repression lag, the gene is off, but you have the pause polymerase. The SOG gene will never come back on in the mesoderm, and so eventually the polycomb repressors take off the pause polymerase at the promoter and replace it with a position nucleosome. So what we believe the polycomb repressors are doing is to convert repressed genes that are poised into repressed genes that are silenced that now have a nucleosome at the promoter instead of pause polymerase. And that's a more uh, permanent form of repression. It's harder to turn this gene back on than this type of gene. So then if we take away polycomb, as seen in the ESC mutants, of course, there's an increase in the pause polymerase because we haven't achieved this reaction of replacing the pause polymerase at repressed genes with the position nucleosome. So that's our model. So I'm going to just end by acknowledging the associates in the lab who uh, did the work. The first part on uh, shadow enhancers and robustness in response to changes in temperature, that was done by a graduate student, Mike Perry. The studies on pause polymerase promoting rapid and synchronous patterns of gene activation and pause polymerase working with shadow enhancers to give very high rates of synthesis, such as rapid synthesis of snail transcription. This was the work of a graduate student named Alistair Boddicker. The visualization of repression and the repression lag I discussed regarding the uh, inhibition of SOG expression in the ventral mesoderm by snail. That was the work of a graduate student named Jacques Bothma. And finally, this last part, that the polycomb mutants such as ESC replaced the pause polymerase at repressed genes with a position nucleosome to convert them to a silent state. That was the work of a postdoc named Vivek Chopra. The studies on pause polymerase were launched in uh, collaborative studies done initially with Julia Zeitlinger and Rick Young at MIT. Julia was a postdoc at that time. She now has her own lab at the Stowers Institute in Kansas City. And more recently, we've collaborated with a postdoc named Leighton Core in John Liss's lab at Cornell on um, the pause polymerase and the fact that the bound polymerase is in an active state based on whole genome nuclear run-on assays. And with that, I will thank all of you out there in the ether for your time.